Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Ann Jacobs, writing as Linda Brent, published Boston, 1861. Preface by the Author Reader, be assured this narrative is no fiction. I am aware that some of my adventures may seem incredible, but they are nevertheless strictly true. I have not exaggerated the wrongs inflicted by slavery. On the contrary, my descriptions fall far short of the facts. I have concealed the names of places and given persons fictitious names. I had no motive for secrecy on my own account, but I deemed it kind and considerate towards others to pursue this course. I wish I were more competent to the task I have undertaken, but I trust my readers will excuse deficiencies in consideration of circumstances. I was born and reared in slavery, and I remained in a slave state 27 years. Since I have been at the North, it has been necessary for me to work diligently for my own support and the education of my children. This has not left me much leisure to make up for the loss of early opportunities to improve myself, and it has compelled me to write these pages at irregular intervals, whenever I could snatch an hour from household duties. When I first arrived in Philadelphia, Bishop Payne advised me to publish a sketch of my life, but I told him I was altogether incompetent to such an undertaking. Though I have improved my mind somewhat since that time, I still remain of the same opinion, but I trust my motives will excuse what might otherwise seem presumptuous. I have not written my experiences in order to attract attention to myself. On the contrary, it would have been more pleasant to me to have been silent about my own history. Neither do I care to excite sympathy for my own sufferings, but I do earnestly desire to arouse the women of the North to a realizing sense of the condition of two millions of women at the South, still in bondage, suffering what I suffered, and most of them far worse. I want to add my testimony to that of the abler pens to convince the people of the free states what slavery really is. Only by experience can anyone realize how deep and dark and foul is that pit of abominations. May the blessing of God rest on this imperfect effort in behalf of my persecuted people. Chapter 1 Childhood I was born a slave, but I never knew it till six years of happy childhood had passed away. My father was a carpenter and considered so intelligent and skillful in his trade that when buildings out of the common line were to be erected, he was sent for from long distances to be head workman, on condition of paying his mistress $200 a year and supporting himself. He was allowed to work at his trade and manage his own affairs. His strongest wish was to purchase his children, but though he several times offered his hard earnings for that purpose, he never succeeded. In complexion, my parents were a light shade of brownish yellow and were termed mulattoes. They lived together in a comfortable home, and though we were all slaves, I was so fondly shielded that I never dreamed I was a piece of merchandise, trusted to them for safekeeping, and liable to be demanded of them at any moment. I had one brother, William, who was two years younger than myself, a bright, affectionate child. I had also a great treasure in my maternal grandmother, who was a remarkable woman in many respects. She was the daughter of a planter in South Carolina who, at his death, left her mother and his three children free with money to go to St. Augustine, where they had relatives. It was during the Revolutionary War, and they were captured on their passage, carried back, and sold to different purchasers. Such was the story my grandmother used to tell me, but I do not remember all the particulars. She was a little girl when she was captured and sold to the keeper of a large hotel. I have often heard her tell how hard she fared during childhood, but as she grew older she evinced so much intelligence and was so faithful that her master and mistress could not help seeing it was for their interest to take care of such a valuable piece of property. She became an indispensable personage in the household, officiating in all capacities, from cook and wet nurse to seamstress. She was much praised for her cooking, and her nice crackers became so famous in the, in the neighborhood that many people were desirous of obtaining them. 
In consequence of numerous requests of this kind, she asked permission of her mistress to bake crackers at night, after all the household work was done, and she obtained leave to do it, provided she would clothe herself and her children from the profits. Upon these terms, after working hard all day for her mistress, she began her midnight bakings, assisted by her two oldest children. The business proved profitable, and each year she laid by a little, which was saved for a fund to purchase her children. Her master died, and the property was divided among his heirs. The widow had her dower in the hotel, which she continued to keep open. My grandmother remained in her service as a slave, but her children were divided among her master's children. As she had five, Benjamin, the youngest one, was sold in order that each heir might have an equal portion of dollars and cents. There was so little difference in our ages that he seemed more like my brother than my uncle. He was a bright, handsome lad, nearly white, for he inherited the complexion my grandmother had derived from Anglo-Saxon ancestors. Though only ten years old, $720 were paid for him. His sale was a terrible blow to my grandmother, but she was naturally hopeful, and she went to work with renewed energy, trusting in time to be able to purchase some of her children. She had laid up $300, which her mistress one day begged as a loan, promising to pay her soon. The reader probably knows that no promise or writing given to a slave is legally binding, for according to southern laws, a slave being property can hold no property. When my grandmother lent her hard earnings to her mistress, she trusted solely to her honor, the honor of a slaveholder to a slave. To this good grandmother, I was indebted for many comforts. My brother Willie and I often received portions of the crackers, cakes, and preserves she made to sell. And after we ceased to be children, we were indebted to her for many more important services. Such were the unusually fortunate circumstances of my early childhood. When I was six years old, my mother died. And then for the first time, I learned, by the talk around me, that I was a slave. My mother's mistress was the daughter of my grandmother's mistress. She was the foster sister of my mother. They were both nourished at my grandmother's breast. In fact, my mother had been weaned at three months old that the babe of the mistress might obtain sufficient food. They played together as children. And when they became women, my mother was a most faithful servant to her whiter foster sister. On her deathbed, her mistress promised that her children should never suffer for anything and during her lifetime she kept her word. They all spoke kindly of my dead mother, who had been a slave merely in name, but in nature was noble and womanly. I grieved for her, and my young mind was troubled with the thought who would now take care of me and my little brother. I was told that my home was now to be with her mistress, and I found it a happy one. No toilsome or disagreeable duties were imposed on me, my mistress was so kind to me that I was always glad to do her bidding, and proud to labor for her as much as my young years would permit. I would sit by her side for hours, sewing diligently, with a heart as free from care as that of any freeborn white child. When she thought I was tired, she would send me out to run and jump, and away I bounded, to gather berries or flowers to decorate her room. Those were happy days, too happy to last. The slave child had no thought for the morrow, but there came that blight which too surely waits on every human being born to be a chattel. When I was nearly twelve years old, my kind mistress sickened and died. As I saw the cheek grow paler and the eye more glassy, how earnestly I prayed in my heart that she might live. I loved her, for she had been almost like a mother to me. My prayers were not answered. She died, and they buried her in the little churchyard where, day after day, my tears fell upon her grave. I was sent to spend a week with my grandmother. I was now old enough to begin to think of the future, and again and again I asked myself what they would do with me. I felt sure I should never find another mistress so kind as the one who was gone. She had promised my dying mother that her children should never suffer for anything. And when I remembered that, and recalled her many proofs of attachment to me, I could not help having some hopes that she had left me free. My friends were almost certain it would be so. They thought she would be sure to do it on account of my mother's love and faithful service. But, alas, 
We all know that the memory of a faithful slave does not avail much to save her children from the auction block. After a brief period of suspense, the will of my mistress was read, and we learned that she had bequeathed me to her sister's daughter, a child of five years old. So vanished our hopes. My mistress had taught me the precepts of God's word. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. But I was her slave, and I suppose she did not recognize me as her neighbor. I would give much to blot out from my memory that one great wrong. As a child, I loved my mistress, and looking back on the happy days I spent with her, I try to think with less bitterness of this act of injustice. While I was with her, she taught me to read and spell, and for this privilege which so rarely falls to the lot of a slave, I bless her memory. She possessed but few slaves, and at her death, those were all distributed among her relatives. Five of them were my grandmother's children, and had shared the same milk that nourished her mother's children. Notwithstanding my grandmother's long and faithful service to her owners, not one of her children escaped the auction block. These God-breathing machines are no more in the sight of their masters than the cotton they plant, or the horses they tend. Chapter 2 The New Master and Mistress Dr. Flint, a physician in the neighborhood, had married the sister of my mistress, and I was now the property of their little daughter. It was not without murmuring that I prepared for my new home, and what added to my unhappiness was the fact that my brother William was purchased by the same family. My father, by his nature as well as by the habit of transacting business as a skillful mechanic, had more of the feelings of a free man than is common among slaves. My brother was a spirited boy, and being brought up under such influences, he daily detested the name of master and mistress. One day when his father and his mistress both happened to call him at the same time, he hesitated between the two, being perplexed to know which had the strongest claim upon his obedience. He finally concluded to go to his mistress. When my father reproved him for it, he said, "'You both called me, and I didn't know which I ought to go to first. "'You are my child,' replied our father, "'and when I call you, you should come immediately, "'if you have to pass through fire and water.' Poor Willie, he was now to learn his first lesson of obedience to a master. Grandmother tried to cheer us with hopeful words, and they found an echo in the credulous hearts of youth. When we entered our new home, we encountered cold looks, cold words, and cold treatment. We were glad when the night came. On my narrow bed I moaned and wept. It. I felt so desolate and alone. I had been there nearly a year when my dear little friend of mine was buried. I heard her mother sob as the clods fell on the coffin of her only child, and I turned away from the grave, feeling thankful that I still had something left to love. I met my grandmother, who said, Come with me, Linda. And from her tone, I knew that something sad had happened. She led me apart from the people and said, My child, your father is dead dead. How could I believe it? He had died so suddenly I had not even heard that he was sick. I went home with my grandmother. My heart rebelled against God, who had taken from me mother, father, mistress, and friend. The good grandmother tried to comfort me. Who knows the ways of God? said she. Perhaps they have been kindly taken from the evil days to come. Years afterwards, I often thought of this. She promised to be a mother to her grandchildren, so far as she might be permitted to do so, and, strengthened by her love, I returned to my master's. I thought I should be allowed to go to my father's house the next morning, but I was ordered to go for flowers, that my mistress's house might be decorated for an evening party. I spent the day gathering flowers and weaving them into festoons while the dead body of my father was lying within a mile of me. What cared my owners for that? He was merely a piece of property. Moreover, they thought he had spoiled his children by teaching them to feel that they were human beings. 
This was blasphemous doctrine for a slave to teach, presumptuous in him, and dangerous to the masters. The next day I followed his remains to a humble grave beside that of my dear mother. There were those who knew my father's worth and respected his memory. My home now seemed more dreary than ever. The laugh of the little slave children sounded harsh and cruel. It was selfish to feel so about the joy of others. My brother moved about with a very grave face. I tried to comfort him by saying, Take courage, Willie. Brighter days will come by and by. You don't know anything about it, Linda, he replied. We shall have to stay here all our days. We shall never be free. I argued that we were growing older and stronger, and that perhaps we might before long be allowed to hire our own time and then we could earn money to buy our freedom. William declared this was much easier to say than to do. Moreover, he did not intend to buy his freedom. We held daily controversies upon this subject. Little attention was paid to the slaves' meals in Dr. Flint's house. If they could catch a bit of food while it was going, well and good. I gave myself no trouble on that score, for on my various errands I passed my grandmother's house, where there was always something to spare for me. I was frequently threatened with punishment if I stopped there. And my grandmother, to avoid detaining me, often stood at the gate with something for my breakfast or dinner. I was indebted to her for all my comforts, spiritual or temporal. It was her labor that supplied my scanty wardrobe. I have a vivid recollection of the Lindsay Woolsey dress given me every winter by Mrs. Flint. How I hated it! It was one of the badges of slavery. While my grandmother was thus helping to support me from her hard earnings, the $300 she had lent her mistress were never repaid. When her mistress died, her son-in-law, Dr. Flint, was appointed executor. When grandmother applied to him for payment, he said the estate was insolvent and the law prohibited payment. It did not, however, prohibit him from retaining the silver candelabra which had been purchased with that money. I presume they will be handed down in the family from generation to generation. My grandmother's mistress had always promised her that, at her death, she should be free, and it was said that in her will she made good the promise. But when the estate was settled, Dr. Flint told the faithful old servant that, under existing circumstances, it was necessary she should be sold. On the appointed day, the customary advertisement was posted up, proclaiming that there would be a public sale of Negroes, horses, and etc. Dr. Flint called to tell my grandmother that he was unwilling to wound her feelings by putting her up at an auction, and that he would prefer to dispose of her at private sale. My grandmother saw through his hypocrisy. She understood very well that he was ashamed of the job. She was a very spirited woman, and if he was base enough to sell her when her mistress intended she should be free, she was determined the public should know it. She had for a long time supplied many families with crackers and preserves. Consequently, Aunt Marthy, as she was called, was generally known, and everybody who knew her respected her intelligence and good character. Her long and faithful service in the family was also well known, and the intention of her mistress to leave her free. When the day of sale came, she took her place among the chattels, and at the first call she sprang upon the auction block. Many voices called out, Shame! Shame! Who is going to sell you, Aunt Marthy? Don't stand there. That is no place for you. Without saying a word, she quietly awaited her fate. No one bid for her. At last a feeble voice said, Fifty dollars. It came from a maiden lady, seventy years old, the sister of my grandmother's deceased mistress. She had lived forty years under the same roof with my grandmother. She knew how faithfully she had served her owners and how cruelly she had been defrauded of her rights, and she resolved to protect her. The auctioneer waited for a higher bid, but her wishes were respected. No one bid above her. She could neither read nor write, and when the bill of sale was made out, she signed it with a cross. But what consequence was that, when she had a big heart overflowing with human kindness? She gave the old servant her freedom. At that time, my grandmother was just 50 years old. 
laborious years had passed since then, and now my brother and I were slaves to the man who had defrauded her of her money and tried to defraud her of her freedom. One of my mother's sisters, called Aunt Nancy, was also a slave in his family. She was a kind, good aunt to me and, and supplied the place of both housekeeper and waiting maid to her mistress. She was, in fact, at the beginning and end of everything. Mrs. Flint, like many southern women, was totally deficient in energy. She had not strength to superintend her household affairs, but her nerves were so strong that she could sit in her easy chair and see a woman whipped till the blood trickled from her every stroke of the lash. She was a member of the church, but partaking of the Lord's Supper did not seem to put her in a Christian frame of mind. If dinner was not served at the exact time on that particular Sunday, she would station herself in the kitchen and wait till it was dished and then spit in all the kettles and pans that had been used for cooking. She did this to prevent the cook and her children from eking out their meager fare with the remains of the gravy and other scrapings. The slaves could get nothing to eat except what she chose to give them. Provisions were weighed out by the pound and ounce three times a day. I can assure you she gave them no chance to eat wheat bread from her flour barrel. She knew how many biscuits a quart of flour would make and exactly what size they ought to be. Dr. Flint was an epicure. The cook never sent a dinner to his table without fear and trembling, for if there happened to be a dish not to his liking, he would either order her to be whipped or compel her to eat every mouthful of it in his presence. The poor hungry creature might not have objected to eating it, but she did not object to having her master cram it down her throat till she choked. They had a pet dog that was a nuisance in the house. The cook was ordered to make some Indian mush for him. He refused to eat, and when his head was held over it, the froth flowed from his mouth into the basin. He died a few minutes after. When Dr. Flint came in, he said the mush had not been well cooked, and that was the reason the animal would not eat it. He sent for the cook and compelled her to eat it. He thought that the woman's stomach was stronger than the dog's, but her sufferings afterwards proved that he was mistaken. This poor woman endured many cruelties from her master and mistress. Sometimes she was locked up, away from her nursing baby, for a whole day and night. When I had been in the family a few weeks, one of the plantation slaves was brought to town by order of his master. It was near night when he arrived, and Dr. Flint ordered him to be taken to the workhouse and tied up to the joist so that his feet would just escape the ground. In that situation, he was to wait till the doctor had taken his tea. I shall never forget that night. Never before in my life had I heard hundreds of blows fall in succession on a human being. His piteous groans and his, Oh, pray don't, Massa, rang in my ear for months afterwards. There were many conjectures as to the cause of this terrible punishment. Some said Master accused him of stealing corn. Others said the slave had quarreled with his wife in presence of the overseer, and had accused his master of being the father of her child. They were both black, and the child was very fair. I went into the workhouse next morning and saw the cowhide still wet with blood and the boards all covered with gore. The poor man lived and continued to quarrel with his wife. A few months afterwards, Dr. Flint handed them both over to a slave trader. The guilty man put their value into his pocket and had the satisfaction of knowing that they were out of sight and hearing. When the mother was delivered into the trader's hands, she said, You promised to treat me well. To which he replied, You have let your tongue run too far, damn you. She had forgotten that it was a crime for a slave to tell who was the father of her child. From others than the master, persecution also comes in such cases. I once saw a young slave girl dying soon after the birth of a child, nearly white. In her agony she cried out, O oh Lord, come and take me. Her mistress stood by and mocked at her like an incarnate fiend. You suffer, do you? she exclaimed. I am glad of it. You deserve it all, and more, too. The girl's mother said, The baby is dead, thank God, and I hope my poor child will soon be in heaven, too. Heaven, retorted the mistress, there is no such place for the like of her and her bastard. The poor mother turned away, sobbing. Her dying daughter called her feebly, 
and as she bent over her I heard her say, Don't grieve so, mother. God knows all about it, and he will have mercy upon me. Her sufferings afterwards became so intense that her mistress felt unable to stay. But when she left the room, the scornful smile was still on her lips. Seven children called her mother. The poor black woman had but the one child, whose eyes she saw closing in death, while she thanked God for taking her away from the greater bitterness of life. Chapter 3. The Slave's New Year's Day Dr. Flint owned a fine residence in town, several farms and about fifty slaves, besides hiring a number by the year. Hiring day at the South takes place on the 1st of January. On the 2nd, the slaves are expected to go to their new masters. On a farm, they work until the corn and cotton are laid. They then have two holidays. Some masters give them a good dinner under the trees. This over, they work until Christmas Eve. If no heavy charges are meantime brought against them, they are given four or five holidays, whichever the master or overseer may think proper. Then comes New Year's Eve, and they gather together their little alls, or more properly speaking, their little nothings, and wait anxiously for the dawning of day. At the appointed hour, the grounds are thronged with men, women, and children, waiting like criminals to hear their doom pronounced. The slave is sure to know who is the most humane or cruel master within forty miles of him. It is easy to find out, on that day, who clothes and feeds his slaves well, for he is surrounded by a crowd, begging, Please, Massa, hire me this year. I will work very hard, Massa. If a slave is unwilling to go with his new master, he is whipped, or locked up in jail until he consents to go, and promises not to run away during the year. Should he chance to change his mind, thinking it justifiable to violate an extorted promise? Woe unto him if he is caught. The whip is used till the blood flows at his feet, and his stiffened limbs are put in chains to be dragged in the field for days and days. If he lives until the next year, perhaps the same man will hire him again without even giving him an opportunity of going to the hiring ground. After those for hire are disposed of, those for sale are called up. Oh, you happy free women, contrast your New Year's Day with that of the poor bondwoman. With you it is a pleasant season, and the light of the day is blessed. Friendly wishes meet you everywhere, and gifts are showered upon you. Even hearts that have been estranged from you soften at this season, and lips that have been silent echo back, I wish you a happy New Year. Children bring their little offerings and raise their rosy lips for a caress. They are your own, and no hand but that of death can take them from you. But to the slave mother, New Year's Day comes laden with peculiar sorrows. She sits on her cold cabin floor watching the children, who may all be torn from her the next morning. And often does she wish that she and they might die before the day dawns. She may be an ignorant creature, degraded by the system that has brutalized her from childhood. But she has a mother's instincts, and is capable of feeling a mother's agonies. On one of these sale days, I saw a mother lead seven children to the auction block. She knew that some of them would be taken from her, but they took all. The children sold to a slave trader, and their mother was bought by a man in her own town. Before night, her children were all far away. She begged the trader to tell her where he intended to take them. This he refused to do. How could he, when he knew he would sell them, one by one, wherever he could command the highest price? I met that mother in the street, and her wild, haggard face lives today in my mind. She wrung her hands in anguish and exclaimed, Gone! All gone! Why don't God kill me? I had no words wherewith to comfort her. Instances of this kind are of daily, yea, of hourly, occurrence. Slaveholders have a method, peculiar to their institution, of getting rid of old slaves whose lives have been worn out in their service. I knew an old woman who, for seventy years, faithfully served her master. She had become almost helpless from hard labor and disease. Her owners moved to Alabama, and the old black woman was left to be sold to anybody who would give twenty dollars for her. Chapter 4 
the slave who dared to feel like a man. Two years had passed since I entered Dr. Flint's family, and those years had brought much of the knowledge that comes from experience, though they had afforded little opportunity for any other kinds of knowledge. My grandmother had, as much as possible, been a mother to her orphan grandchildren. By perseverance and unwearied industry, she was now mistress of a snug little home surrounded with the necessaries of life. She would have been happy could her children have shared them with her. There remained but three children and two grandchildren, all slaves. Most earnestly did she strive to make us feel that it was the will of God, and he had seen fit to place us under such circumstances. And though it seemed hard, we ought to pray for contentment. It was a beautiful faith coming from a mother who could not call her children her own. But I and Benjamin, her youngest boy, condemned it. We reasoned that it was much more the will of God that we should be situated as she was. We longed for a home like hers. There we always found sweet balsam for our troubles. She was so loving, so sympathizing. She always met us with a smile and listened with patience to all our sorrows. She spoke so hopefully that unconsciously the clouds gave place to sunshine. There was a grand big oven in there too that baked bread and nice things for the town, and we knew there was always a chi and we knew there was always a choice bit in store for us. But alas, even the charms of the old oven failed to reconcile us to our hard lot. Benjamin was now a tall, handsome lad, strongly and gracefully made, and with a spirit too bold and daring for a slave. My brother William, now twelve years old, had the same aversion to the word master that he had when he was an urchin of seven years. I was his confidant. He came to me with all his troubles. I remember one instance in particular. It was on a lovely spring morning, and when I marked the sunlight dancing here and there, its beauty seemed to mock my sadness, for my master, whose restless, craving, vicious nature roved about day and night, seeking whom to devour, had just left me. With stinging, scorching words, words that scathed ear and brain like fire. Oh, how I despised him. I thought how glad I should be if some day when he walked the earth it would open and swallow him up, and disencumber the world of a plague. When he told me that I was made for his use, made to obey his command in every thing, that I was nothing but a slave whose will must and should surrender to his, never before had my puny arm felt half so strong. So deeply was I absorbed in painful reflections afterwards that I neither saw nor heard the entrance of anyone till the voice of William sounded close beside me, Linda, said he, what makes you look so sad? I love you. Oh, Linda, isn't this a bad world? Everybody seems so cross and unhappy. I wish I had died when poor father did. I told him that everybody was not cross or unhappy, that those who had pleasant homes and kind friends and who were not afraid to love them were happy. But we who were slave children without father or mother, could not expect to be happy. We must be good. Perhaps that would bring us contentment. Yes, he said. I try to be good, but what's the use? They are all the time troubling me. Then he proceeded to relate his afternoon's difficulty with young Master Nicholas. It seemed that the brother of Master Nicholas had pleased himself with making up stories about William. Master Nicholas said he should be flogged, and he would do it. Whereupon he went to work, but William fought bravely, and the young master, finding he was getting the better of him, undertook to tie his hands behind him. He failed in that likewise. By dint of kicking and fisting, William came out of the skirmish none the worse for a few scratches. He continued to discourse on his young master's meanness, how he whipped the little boys, but was a perfect coward when a tussle ensued between him and the white boys of his own size. On such occasions he always took to his legs, William had other charges to make against him. One was rubbing up pennies with quicksilver, passing them off for quarters of a dollar on an old man who kept a fruit stall. William was often sent to buy fruit, and he earnestly inquired of me what he ought to do under such circumstances. 
I told him it was certainly wrong to de deceive the old man and that it was his duty to tell him of the impositions practiced by his young master. I assured him the old man would not be slow to comprehend the whole, and there the matter would end. William thought it might with the old man, but not with him. He said he did not mind the smart of the whip, but he did not like the idea of being whipped. While I advised him to be good and forgiving, I was not unconscious of the beam in my own eye. It was the very knowledge of my own shortcomings that urged me to retain, if possible, some sparks of my brother's God-given nature. I had not lived fourteen years in slavery for nothing. I had felt, seen, and heard enough to read the characters and question the motives of those around me. The war of my life had begun, and though one of God's most powerless creatures, I resolved never to be conquered, alas, for me. If there was one pure, sunny spot for me, I believed it to be in Benjamin's heart, and in another's whom I loved with all the ardor of a girl's first love. My owner knew of it and sought in every way to render me miserable. He did not resort to corporal punishment, but to all the petty, tyrannical ways that human ingenuity could devise. I remember the first time I was punished. It was in the month of February. My grandmother had taken my old shoes and replaced them with a new pair. I needed them, for several inches of snow had fallen, and it still continued to fall. When I walked through Mrs. Flint's room, their creaking grated harshly on her refined nerves. She called me to her and asked what I had about me that made such a horrid noise. I told her it was my new shoes. "'Take them off,' said she. And if you put them on again, I'll throw them into the fire. I took them off, and my stockings also. She then sent me a long distance on an errand. As I went through the snow, my bare feet tingled. That night I was very hoarse, and I went to bed thinking the next day would find me sick, perhaps dead. What was my grief on waking to find myself quite well? I had imagined, if I died or was laid up for some time, that my mistress would feel a twinge of remorse that she had so hated, the little imp, as she styled me. It was my ignorance of that mistress that gave rise to such extravagant imaginings. Dr. Flint occasionally had high prices offered for me, but he always said, she don't belong to me, she's my daughter's property, and I have no right to sell her. Good, honest man. My young mistress was still a child, and I could look for no protection from her. I loved her, and she returned my affection. I once heard her father allude to her attachment to me, and his wife promptly replied that it proceeded from fear. This put unpleasant doubts into my mind. Did the child feign what she did not feel? Or was her mother jealous of the might of love she bestowed on me? I concluded it must be the latter. I said to myself, Surely little children are true. One afternoon, I sat at my sewing, feeling unusual depression of spirits. My mistress had been accusing me of an offense, of which I had assured her I was perfectly innocent, but I saw by the contemptuous curl of her lip that she believed I was telling a lie. I wondered for what wise purpose God was leading me through such thorny paths, and whether still darker days were in store for me. As I sat musing this, the door opened softly and William came in. Well, brother, said I, what is the matter this time? Oh, Linda, Ben and his master have had a dreadful time, said he. My first thought was that Benjamin was killed. Don't be frightened, Linda, said William. I will tell you all about it. It appeared that Benjamin's master had sent for him, and he did not immediately obey the summons. When he did, his master was angry and began to whip him. He resisted. Master and slave fought, and finally the master was thrown. Benjamin had cause to tremble, for he had thrown to the ground his master, one of the richest men in town. I anxiously awaited the result. That night I stole to my grandmother's house, and Benjamin also stole thither from his master's. My grandmother had gone to spend a day or two with an old friend living in the country. I have come, said Benjamin, to tell you goodbye. I'm going away. I inquired where. To the north, he replied. I looked at him to see whether he was in earnest. 
I saw it all in his firm, set mouth. I implored him not to go. But he paid no heed to my words. He said he was no longer a boy, and every day made his yoke more galling. He had raised his hand against his master and was to be publicly whipped for the offense. I reminded him of the poverty and hardships he must encounter among strangers. I told him he might be caught and brought back. And that was terrible to think of. He grew vexed and asked if pro poverty and hardships with freedom were not preferable to our treatment in slavery. Linda, he continued, we're dogs here. Footballs, cattle, everything that's mean. No, I will not stay. Let them bring me back. We don't die but once. He was right. But it was hard to give him up. Go, said I, and break your mother's heart. I repented of my words ere they were out. Linda, said he, speaking as I had not heard him speak that evening, how could you say that? Poor mother, be kind to her, Linda, and you too, Cousin Fanny. Cousin Fanny was a friend who had lived some years with us. Farewells were exchanged, and the bright, kind boy, endeared to us by so many acts of love, vanished from our sight. It is not necessary to state how he made his escape. Suffice it to say, he was on his way to New York when a violent storm overtook the vessel. The captain said he must put into the nearest port. This alarmed Benjamin, who was aware that he would be advertised in every port near his own town. His embarrassment was noticed by the captain. To port they went. There the advertisement met the captain's eye. Benjamin so exactly answered its description that the captain laid hold on him and bound him in chains. The storm passed, and they proceeded to New York. Before reaching that port, Benjamin managed to get off his chains and throw them overboard. He escaped from the vessel, but was pursued, captured, and carried back to his master. When my grandmother returned home and found her youngest child had fled, great was her sorrow. But with characteristic piety, she said, God's will be done. Each morning, she inquired if any news had been heard from her boy. Yes, news was heard. The master was rejoicing over a letter announcing the capture of his human chattel. That day seems but as yesterday. So well do I remember it. I saw him led through the streets in chains to jail. His face was ghastly pale, yet full of determination. He had begged one of the sailors to go to his mother's house and ask her not to meet him. He said the sight of her distress would take from him all self-control. She yearned to see him, and she went, but she screened herself in the crowd that it might be as her child had said. We were not allowed to visit him, but we had known the jailer for years, and he was a kind-hearted man. At midnight, he opened the jail door for my grandmother and myself to enter in disguise. When we entered the cell, not a sound broke the stillness. Benjamin, Benjamin, whispered my grandmother. No answer. Benjamin. She again faltered. There was a jingle of chains. The moon had just risen and cast an uncertain light through the bars of the window. We knelt down and took Benjamin's cold hands in ours. We did not speak. Sobs were heard, and Benjamin's lips were unsealed, for his mother was weeping on his neck. How vividly does memory bring back that sad night? Mother and son talked together. He asked her pardon for the suffering he had caused her. She said she had nothing to forgive. She could not blame his desire for freedom. He told her that when he was captured, he broke away and was about casting himself into the river when thoughts of her came over him, and he desisted. She asked if he did not also think of God. I fancied I saw his face grow fierce in the moonlight. He answered, No, I did not think of him. When a man is hunted like a wild beast, he forgets there is a God, a heaven. He forgets everything in his struggle to get beyond the reach of the bloodhounds. Don't talk so, Benjamin, said she. Put your trust in God. Be humble, my child, and your master will forgive you. Forgive me for what, mother? For not letting him treat me like a dog? No, I will never humble myself to him. I have worked for him for nothing all my life, and I am repaid with stipes, with stripes and imprisonment. 
Here I will stay till I die or till he sells me. The poor mother shuddered at his words. I think he felt it. For when he next spoke, his voice was calmer. Don't fret about me, mother. I ain't worth it, said he. I wish I had some of your goodness. You bear everything patiently, just as though you thought it was all right. I wish I could. She told him she had not always been so. Once she was like him. But when sore troubles came upon her and she had no arm to lean upon, she learned to call on God, and he lightened her burdens. She besought him to do likewise. We overstayed our time and were obliged to hurry from the jail. Benjamin had been imprisoned three weeks when my grandmother went to intercede for him with his master. He was immovable. He said Benjamin should serve as an example to the rest of his slaves. He should be kept in jail till he was subdued or be sold if he got but one dollar for him. However, he afterwards relented in some degree. The chains were taken off and we were allowed to visit him. As his food was of the coarsest kind, we carried him as often as possible a warm supper, accompanied with some little luxury for the jailer. Three months elapsed, and there was no prospect of release or of a purchaser. One day he was heard to sing and laugh. This piece of indecorum was sold to his master, and the overseer was ordered to rechain him. He was now confined in an apartment with other prisoners who were covered with filthy rags. Benjamin was chained near them and was soon covered with vermin. He worked at his chains till he succeeded in getting out of them. He passed them through the bars of the window with a request that they should be taken to his master, and he should be informed that he was covered with vermin. This audacity was punished with heavier chains and prohibition of our visits. My grandmother continued to send him fresh changes of clothes. The old ones were burned up. The last night we saw him in jail, his mother still begged him to send for his master and beg his pardon. Neither persuasion nor argument could turn him from his purpose. He calmly answered, I am waiting his time. Those chains were mournful to hear. Another three months passed, and Benjamin left his prison walls. We that loved him waited to bid him a long and last farewell. A slave trader had bought him. You remember, I told you what price he bought when ten years of age. Now he was more than twenty years old and sold for three hundred dollars. The master had been blind to his own interest. Long confinement had made his face too pale, his form too thin. Moreover, the trader had heard something of his character, and it did not strike him as suitable for a slave. He said he would give any price if the handsome lad was a girl. We thanked God that he was not. Could you have seen that mother clinging to her child when they fastened the irons upon his wrists? Could you have heard her heart-rending groans and seen her bloodshot eyes wander wildly from face to face, vainly pleading for mercy? Could you have witnessed that scene as I saw it? You would exclaim, Slavery is damnable! Benjamin, her youngest, her pet, was forever gone. She could not realize it. She had had an interview with the trader for the purpose of ascertaining if Benjamin could be purchased. She was told it was impossible, as he had given bonds not to sell him till he was out of the state. He promised that he would not sell him till he reached New Orleans. With a strong arm and unvaried trust, my grandmother began her work of love. Benjamin must be free. If she succeeded, she knew they would still be separated, but the sacrifice was not too great. Day and night she labored. The trader's price would treble that he gave, but she was not discouraged. She employed a lawyer to write to a gentleman whom she knew in New Orleans. She begged him to interest himself for Benjamin, and he willingly favored her request. When he saw Benjamin and stated his business, he thanked him, but said he preferred to wait a while before making the trader an offer. He knew he had tried to obtain a high price for him and had invariably failed. This encouraged him to make another effort for freedom. So one morning, long before day, Benjamin was missing. He was riding over the blue billows bound for Baltimore. 
for once his white face did him a kindly service. They had no suspicion that it belonged to a slave. Otherwise, the law would have been followed out to the letter, and the thing rendered back to slavery. The brightest skies are often overshadowed by the darkest clouds. Benjamin was taken sick and compelled to remain in Baltimore three weeks. His strength was slow in returning, and his desire to continue his journey seemed to retard his, his recovery. How could he get strength without air and exercise? He resolved to venture on a short walk. A by-street was selected where he thought himself secure of not being met by anyone that knew him. But a voice called out, Hello, Ben, my boy, what are you doing here? His first impulse was to run, but his legs trembled so that he could not stir. He turned to confront his antagonist, and behold, there stood his old master's next-door neighbor. He thought it was all over with him now, but it proved otherwise. That man was a miracle. He possessed a goodly number of slaves, and yet was not quite deaf to that mystic clock, whose ticking is rarely heard in the slaveholder's breast. "'Ben, you are sick,' said he. "'Why, you look like a ghost. I guess I gave you something of a start. Never mind, Ben, I'm not going to touch you. You had a pretty tough time of it, and you may go on your way rejoicing for all me.' But I would advise you to get out of this place, plaguey quick, for there are several gentlemen here from our town. He described the nearest and safest route to New York and added, I shall be glad to tell your mother I have seen you. Goodbye, Ben. Benjamin turned away filled with gratitude and surprise that the town he hated contained such a gem, a gem worthy of a purer setting. This gentleman was a northerner by birth and had married a southern lady. On his return, he told my grandmother that he had seen her son and of the service he had rendered him. Benjamin reached New York safely and concluded to stop there until he had gained strength enough to proceed further. It happened that my grandmother's only remaining son had sailed for the same city on business for his mistress. Through God's providence, the brothers met. You may be sure it was a happy meeting. Oh, Phil, exclaimed Benjamin, I am here at last. Then he told him how near he came to dying, almost in sight of free land, and how he prayed that he might live to get one breath of free air. He said life was worth something now, and it would be hard to die. In the old jail, he had not valued it. Once, he was tempted to destroy it. But something, he did not know what, had prevented him. Perhaps it was fear. He had heard those who professed to be religious declare there was no heaven for self-murderers. And as his life had been pretty hot here, he did not desire a continuation of the same in another world. If I die now, he exclaimed, thank God I shall die a free man. He begged my uncle Philip not to return south, but stay and work with him till they earned enough to buy those at home. His brother told him it would kill their mother if he deserted her in her trouble. She had pledged her house and with difficulty had raised money to buy him. Would he be bought? No, never, he replied. Do you suppose, Phil, when I have got so far out of their clutches, I will give them one red cent? No. And do you suppose I would turn mother out of her home in her old age, that I would let her pay all those hard-earned dollars for me and never to see me? For you know she will stay south as long as her other children are slaves. What a good mother. Tell her to buy you, Phil. You have been a comfort to her, and I have been a trouble. And Linda, poor Linda, what will become of her? Phil, you don't know what a life they lead here. She has told me something about it, and I wish old Flint was dead, or a better man. When I was in jail, he asked her if she didn't want him to ask my master to forgive me and take me home again. She told him no that I didn't want to go back. He got mad and said we were all alike. I never despise my own master half as much as I do that man. There is many a worse slaveholder than my master, but for all that I would not be his slave. While Benjamin was sick, he had parted with nearly all his clothes to pay necessary expenses, but he did not part with a little pin I fastened in his bosom when we parted. It was the most valuable thing I owned and I thought none more worthy to wear it. He had it still. His brother furnished him with clothes and gave him what money he had. They parted with moistened eyes, and as Benjamin turned away, he said, Phil, I part with all my kindred. 
and so it proved. We never heard from him again. Uncle Philip came home, and the first words he uttered when he entered the house were, Mother, Ben is free. I have seen him in New York. She stood looking at him with a bewildered air. Mother, don't you believe it? He said, laying his hand softly upon her shoulder. She raised her hands and exclaimed, God be praised. Let us thank him. She dropped on her knees and poured forth her heart in prayer. Then Philip must sit down and repeat to her every word Benjamin had said. He told her all. Only he forbore to mention how sick and pale her darling looked. Why should he distress her when she could do him no good? The brave old woman still toiled on, hoping to rescue some of her other children. After a while, she succeeded in buying Philip. She paid $800 and came home with the precious document that secured his freedom. The happy mother and son sat together by the old hearthstone that night, telling how proud they were of each other and how they would prove to the world that they could take care of themselves, as they had long taken care of others. We all concluded by saying, He that is willing to be a slave, let him be a slave. 